Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by the Tennessee Department of Tourist Development. Visit tnvacation.com to start planning your trip to Tennessee. Thanks, Emily. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast, everybody, where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Emily, before I introduce today's very special guest, who I like a lot, uh, what is something you have discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? So I learned this week that we have 1,149 books on the bookcase to the entrance to the Enlightenment Gallery. That is very cool. Have you actually looked through those books on that bookcase before? I have. I've seen a few of them, but I haven't looked at each individual one. Um, we have uh, Tom Sawyer um, on there. Uh, and we have a lot of other books on there, too. I, I love to walk over there every once in a while. It's funny because people think they're fake books for some reason, and when they actually find out they're real books. Um, do you know where those books came from? I do not. Uh, the majority of them came from uh, someone who lived across the street from the um, old O'Brien County Museum, and when they passed away, they... Uh, left Discovery Park those books. And so we don't need a ton of books here because we're not a library, but they were perfect for that bookcase. So, all right. So I want to show our very special guest today is Sherry Freeman, director of the Jackson Symphony. Welcome, Sherry. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. So I know that um, Discovery Park of America and the Jackson Symphony have worked together on a number of things, and we, you and I were just talking about some other things that we've got planned. Um, obviously, our as a, as a museum with the mission of inspiring children and adults to see beyond that applies to music, and you guys um, have some incredible, uh, an incredible mission there. Tell me a little bit about the mission of the Jackson Symphony. Well, our mission is much like yours. Ours is to enrich and inspire through the you know through live orchestral music and we're so excited to get to partner with you all as well um you know i hope going forward many many opportunities in which we can bring all the uh, different types of art together and uh just really enrich and inspire west tennessee Fantastic. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of things we're going to do together going forward. Um, I know you, we're going to back up a little bit and talk about where you came from. You came from the huge metropolis of Bradford, Tennessee, in Gibson County. Is that right? It is. Actually, it was Ottawa. And, you know, so if you're uh, familiar with Bradford and Western Sea, I guess it would be a suburb of Bradford. So, uh, yeah, out in the country, born and raised right there in Gibson County my whole entire life. Grew up with all my family around me and, um, you know, went off to college in the 80s. And we, my husband and I landed, you know, back in Jackson. And our son is still and his family are, are in Bradford still. So still and my parents are still there and a sister. And so lots of connections still. In and how far back? How far back does your family go in that? In that community, you know, uh, a genealogy person, have you looked yeah. at your week? <laughs> Unfortunately, not. But a long, long time. All of my, my, both of my parents are from that area, so they were both from Bradford. So when I was born, I had all my great grandparents, and they all lived there. So you know, they had family there even before that. So you know, it's a long, a long history of having lived in that area and. Uh, and been a part of that community. So what what were your uh, parents doing? Were they farmers? But you well, uh, they were always in agriculture. Uh, my mother's parents were, um, you know, they were farmers, uh, land farmers and raised, you know, crops. Uh, my dad's family were was into cattle. They were uh, Patterson and McCaleb um they livestock. And so they were kind of what we would almost think of as, as middlemen. They bought uh, at auctions and sales livestock, and then they sold it to packing houses. So they transported cattle kind of between 
the two. So they would buy for what was then real foot right there in Union City. Uh, and they were so they were they were buyers for those packing houses for years. And then my father brought that cattle part to uh, my mother's family. And so they became merged that became Bopat Farms. And now they're they're, you know, pretty much cattle operation. And then my son went on into that and he is now runs volunteer farms for the McWhorter family. And uh, we're, we're fine raisers of Black Angus cattle. We need to get him on the podcast, don't we? Oh, you absolutely do. Because he's quite a character and a lot of fun and good. And it's great to hear from young, young, you know, uh, the young farmers, the young agriculture people of today. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll work on that. Um, so spoiler alert for those who don't know you, um, you may be one of the most degreed people we've ever had on here. You've, you have, you have, you are very educated. So, um, while you were a young person, uh, growing up in that rural community, were your parents big advocates of education or where did this hunger for knowledge come from? Uh, they really were. Uh, I was fortunate in that both of my parents were college educated and, uh, my Father had a degree uh, in business from the University of Tennessee at Martin. My mother had a degree in education from, from Bethel. And uh, so my mom always taught school. In fact, she taught for 52 years of uh, public school. And uh, my father was always, you know, part of the farm and so independently. But education was always very important to our, to our parents. Uh, that was, you know, they they would sacrifice any number of things to make sure that we were, you know, well educated and that we had opportunities to learn and to uh, embrace, you know, new knowledge. And my, our mother was, you know, very much about making sure that we had been exposed to new or different things and how those opportunities. And really, that's kind of where the love of the arts came. But, but yes. And so then when I finished. Uh, high school and went on to Union University and got an, a degree in education there and then later went on to complete master's and doctorate degrees in, in education as well. So, you know. So, you know, at Discovery Park, I think we, you know, our hope and our goal is that we create some of those light bulb moments for young people when they're visiting here. Um, so I'm always curious about people's childhood um, or young, you know, college, high school, elementary school, light bulb moments. Do you recall any moments where things just turned on for you when it comes to uh, either music or education or a particular subject or anything like that? Well, my family has a, we have a, a, a very, we have perfected a very good dyslexic gene in our family. And we have, you know, held on to that quite uh, hard and passed it along. Uh, but I can remember having somewhat struggled with reading as a young child. And then I re we had a small library that it, at an elementary school library that was literally in a closet. And one day I found these books on the first ladies and the life of the first ladies. And I checked out one of those books and, you know, it was, it was, that was literally a light bulb moment for me because I realized I love to read. And obviously, the more I read, the more, the better I became at reading. And, you know, I knew I went on in a lot of my research and later work was in that, you know, transition, transitioning children from, you know, efferent reading, reading for, you know, to purpose to aesthetic reading and reading for pleasure. And what I found out is the the more you read for pleasure, the larger the vocabulary, you know, the greater that became. And then that knowledge, that love of gaining that knowledge and of kind of solving that problem somewhat became intriguing for me and ways to help other families and other children and our, you know, our own families and our own children through kind of that and, and, you know, how to overcome some of that. So it was really that, that really kind of set me on course. And I'm also quite a passionate person about what I love and do. So, 
you know, that was never stifled by my parents. You know, if I, you know, became, you know, extremely passionate about a topic or an idea or an event or, you know, they really kind of got behind that and encouraged us to really kind of explore and to be independent. And our mother was very good. There were three of us girls. So in a time when, I mean, even when we were growing up, there were still limited opportunities for women. You know, she was very much about us having a voice and and being heard. And so um, I want to, I'm going to um, ask you about reading in a minute, a minute again, but how did she uh, manifest that as a father of daughters? You know, I, of course, have tried to make certain that my daughters have as loud a voice as possible. And uh, to my own detriment, that has uh, come to fruition. So um, <laughs> what kind of things did your mom uh, do to teach that? Well, you know, my mother had been an educator starting in 1963. So she had very much been, you know, a victim of, you know, the the limits that women faced, you know, losing jobs when she became pregnant, uh, you know, not being able to make what a man made, you know, being unable to rise in her profession. You know, she she recognized those limits and, uh, you know, she was quite vocal and strong about the fact that you know, that, that should not be, and, you know, and, and you should not be held back by that. So, you know, she was very good about, you know, you know, moving us forward or helping us to kind of gain ground or, you know, to, to navigate some of that, that, you know, our voice and our knowledge was equal to that out there. And, we also had were we were raised with a very strong work work ethic. You work was not an option; it was understood. You know, so you got out there every day, and whether that be in the field, you know, getting up cows or picking tomatoes or hoeing cotton, or when we got fourteen to go to the city cafe and waitress, which was wonderful. Uh, you know, or, you know, you work was something that was respected and valued in our family. But when we did that and we worked hard, then it was also expected that that would be valued as well. And, and you know, she was quick to encourage us if that work was not being valued to move on, you know, and to, to kind of stay level in, in all of that. How many siblings do you have? I have two other sisters. And, and, oh, so you had a whole family of girls? A whole family. My father always said he was woman poor. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we uh, always uh, try to have at least one male dog in the house so that I'm not the only one. That's right. That's right. Yes. <laughs> um, so, so reading, uh, I was thinking about this yesterday because I love to read, always have, but I have had a hard time lately getting into books. I've got a stack like this tall I need to get into because I'm so addicted to TikTok and Facebook and Twitter and, and the news and emails and, and text messages. And do you think uh, this crop of youngsters that we've been raising the last few years are they reading still? My kids are older now, so I don't know what's going on in the world. Are, are young people still reading the way we did when we were young? Well, you know, I, I always hesitate to say what should be carried forward, or, you know, because it was all, you know, as we age, we always, if we're not careful, we're always looking backwards and, instead of forward. And we're always saying, oh, this new generation doesn't me- measure up to, you know, what we were and you know, as opposed to how well they're doing. I mean, they have a new world to navigate that that was different from ours. So, um, you know, are they reading a actual book that they hold in their hand less? Possibly. Does it mean that they are not reading or that they're not exposed to good literature? I'm not sure about that. I still think there are teachers and educators that are promoting those opportunities. And I still think, I I still think there are people that love the written word, you know, that are passionate about reading. I find, I find myself like you being distracted from books some, but I often wonder, is it because, you know, 
we're riding at the at a speed of electronics now. So maybe are we finding less quality to read because it's more about quantity and how fast you can put out a book? You know, I don't know. You know, sometimes I'm interested. Am I uninterested because I can't seem to find what I once found? Or am I also distracted? But, um, you know, I think reading is, you know, I think we have to make sure we make a habit of that or we have to make sure we slow down enough and turn things off. And I do think that one of the things we have to help this, you know, our this young generation with is learning how to turn things off. You know, we seem to say you have to disconnect. Well, that sounds like a, an extreme to them. They've never been disconnected. But if we can just talk about having quiet space or having an interrupted space, that can be important. You are you are just barely ahead of me. Of course, I don't know how far ahead of me you are, but you are ahead of me in the grandchildren uh, front. And so um, are you doing things with your grandchildren uh, to encourage reading or, or what are some tips you can give us some grandmother tips? Well, I certainly have grandchildren. My children got married and they took to heart that, you know, multiply, get married, multiply. I mean, they had children quickly. So I have four grandchildren, three little boys and one little girl finally. And uh, they're all adorable. I think that the thing that makes reading, I mean, I do think you read to your children. I think that's important. I think it's also important just to have materials available. There were always books and magazines and, you know, the things available in the house to read, the Bible, all kinds of things, recipes, cookbooks, everything was, you know, there was lots of written print available. So with time, as you find things you enjoy, as children find things they enjoy, such as I love to cook. So, you know, it became the recipes and the cookbooks were important to me. Um, I can remember our dad doing the read the Bible through in a year thing with all of us, you know, and we did that, you know. So I think there are uh, I wanted to sing in the choir at the church, you know, so I needed to read for the hymns, you know, to read the songs or I, so I think you just have to make sure that opportunities are available because children will just like all of us did find an area that they love. And that's what you don't want to really hinder. You want to provide that, that opportunity and, and they will read inside that. We, when my girls were little, we had all the children's books that most people had, you know, at that time, and then a few others. But the one, for some reason, we also had this book we had bought at a yard sale that was like that. It was very thick, um, and it was it was a Catholic book, and it was called The Lives of the Saints. And each page was a detailed story of one of the saints all the way back. And for some reason, my girls loved me to read they were full of violence and disease, and they loved every night before they went to sleep, they wanted to read another one of those stories. So they still talk about that. So you just never know, you know, what's going to, what's going to click. That's right. Um, so, so what, what contributed to your ultimate decision uh, to go down the path of education uh, while you were at Union? Or is that, I'm assuming that's when you uh, picked a career uh, what what contributed to that? What was that path like? Well, I think that um, I I really probably knew. I mean, we were a family of, of that was in education. It was my aunts were in it, my mother, you know. So we knew that. My mother had often said it was a wonderful job for a working mother, and I did you know agree with that. I, I found that to truly be the case, and so. Uh, I, you know, I, I had a love of that. I had an understanding of it. You know, I've had people say, you know, how did you learn how to teach? Or as when I worked at the university levels, you know, how, you know, I don't know. I just always knew how to do that. It was a natural gift to me was, you know, being in that classroom was just as comfortable to me as, you know, as anything. I, I don't know. I just knew how to do it. I knew how to you know, help children learn. And uh, I knew how to communicate with them. I knew how to communicate with parents that 
you, you know, it was just a gift. It was just that, it was just that area I was supposed to be in. And then tell us a little bit, you mentioned earlier your uh, degrees in area of specialty. Go into a little bit more about um, all the things you've accomplished from an education front. Well, I, uh, you know, I was fortunate in, in that, you know, I was recognized kind of early on in my career to be an educator, you know, to be a, a quality educator. And for that, I'm most thankful. Um, I had, I, when I, we first married, we lived in Smyrna and I taught for Rutherford County Schools in Laverne and I was made a pilot teacher for the state of Tennessee in some new programs and um, started that back in the uh, late eighties, early nineties and worked on that. When we moved back here, I was fortunate to go to work for Madison County and I worked at Lincoln and that at that time was a magnet school, had just been converted to a magnet school, which gave me an opportunity to help develop some programs there. Uh, and from that, that, that experience kind of led me over into the university realm and I adjunct for, uh, you know, the University of Memphis and Union and uh, Lambeth. And Lambeth is ultimately where I went then and spent some years at Lambeth and uh, kind of supervised their um, student teachers, teachers exiting, because I had had that school experience and and had, um, you know, knowledge of different educators throughout kind of West Tennessee since my family had been in that for so long. And then that that led me back into the the schools after a while. And, and I worked back in classrooms and then ultimately in federal programs as a consulting teacher for Title I. And that was good because I really got to navigate that field. But my my higher ed, my own work from my master's through my doctorate was in, you know, educational leadership. And but then my research work, I did a lot of that in not only what made a quality teacher, but also, you know, how to uh, help children that were in this kind of, you know, that we're struggling with reading and struggling with some of this. So, you know, I really found that my own daughter was really suffered with dyslexia and we had found a path that was extremely successful for her and a way to navigate that. So I felt it was really important to not just hold that knowledge, but to help other families navigate those, those times that were, that were difficult. And uh, Frances has become quite a success story in that. And um, she went on to graduate with honors from Mississippi State and has been very successful in her own uh, career as a child life specialist. She works for uh, the largest grant organization that runs uh, programs for children in the state of Mississippi and Jackson. And so she's done quite well. So I knew that there was a way to help these children be successful, but most importantly, help their families help them be successful. And that really is kind of what became my passion, you know, in in that those latter years of my education. I mean, it can um, be so uh, hard to be a parent of little kids, especially if one has any kind of special needs or doesn't necessarily fit into the mold. I remember my oldest daughter was an early reader. And so other parents were like, what are you doing? Why can she read so quick? What, you know, everybody measures their own child compared to, you know, what, what's going on around them. So it's challenging when you have one who learns differently or has a different skill or, you know, does your heart, I'm sure your heart must go out right now to uh, educators who are trying to navigate this world that we find ourselves in. Oh, it does. You know, there's no doubt that teachers are, you know, kudos to all of them right now. I mean, trying to online teach, I can't even imagine. I'm glad that was never something I really had to do because, I mean, there's just so much to that face-to-face, that child in that classroom, you know, and, you know, it's, uh, you know, a parent's not supposed to be a, a teacher. A parent is supposed to be a parent, and they're supposed to advocate for that child. But, you know, um, I mean, for the most part, you know, they send them, you know, to teachers to to do that. And, you know, when this all happened, that kind of 
blurred those lines and, you know, blurred those roles. So, you know, I certainly think that can be hard. And, you know, a, a critical component of education is for a, a fine educator can catch that, that learning disparity quickly and try to make that turn in it. And, you know, if you can't be in that room with that child, and that, that can make that slower and more difficult. So, you know, it's certainly going to take some strong efforts on everyone's part. Uh, and there'll be lots of weeping to, you know, to battle back these losses. But quality educators can turn that more quickly than probably people are giving them credit for. They're going to yeah, be able great. to turn that. We're going to take a break, and when we get back, we're going to talk a lot about the Jackson Symphony, and you mentioned leadership a while ago and how your leadership skills have been tapped for that. But first, I want to point out um, that you and Priscilla Presley have something in common. Oh, really? <laughs> Both your husbands came from Tupelo. Is that right? Exactly. <laughs> That's correct. So, so your husband's from Tupelo. Where did you uh, meet? We met at Union. We actually met there at Union when we were in college, so... Just right there, but he is. Does he still have family in Tupelo? He does. His whole family is in that uh, in North Mississippi. Most of his family is in New Albany. That's okay. where yeah. they are located. Very nearby. I love Tupelo. Tupelo is a great town. I've got a lot of friends there. Yeah, it, it is. It really is. Okay, well, we, we will be back in just one second. Looking for a family-friendly vacation destination? The new Tennessee Vacation Planning Guide is out now, and it includes tips on the best restaurants in the state, attraction information, where to stay, and more. With the mountains, the music, the rivers, the food, the attractions, and so much more, you'll find the guide is a great way to get the most of your visit to Tennessee. Visit tnvacation.com and print your digital copy today. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. It really helps us get the word out about the cool things happening here in West Tennessee. This is your host, Scott Williams. Our guest today is Sherry Freeman, Executive Director of the Jackson Symphony. So um, you, what was the transition from education to music. Oh, I know. It seemed like that that was a, a large bridge to go across. But, you know, I, I think, I mean, educators' ultimate goal is to leave people better off than you found them, so to speak, you know, where they can navigate life well, where they can learn how to have a balanced life and, and opportunities. So really, the move from education into the arts was probably not as as great of uh, you know a barrier as we often think. Uh, I I had always loved the arts. The first thing my husband and I did when we married and we moved straight on into uh, Nashville when right after our our marriage, and we the first thing we did as a couple was join the the Nashville Symphony. And we, we, we recognized, I think, then our love, our desire to, to have a quality of life, not only a work life, but a quality of life. And I have watched families struggle with that. You know, they've overbooked, they've overcommitted, they've scheduled their children to the point, you know, that every minute of every hour is consumed of the day. And I, I want people and I wanted my students and I wanted, you know, my own children to have these opportunities that enrich their lives without a scheduled event or without another activity, so to speak. And uh, the arts offer that. So being able to come across and provide this opportunity, I, I was excited about. The other reason was we often in education, if we're not very, very careful, we measure things in a, a box that is too small for the population or the, you know, for people. We think that, you know, you have to be a great reader or a great mathematician. Everybody has to go to college, all of these things. 
Well, I recognize that some of these children, when I was teaching them, they could draw beautifully. They could sing wonderfully. They could go on in, in their band classes and they were these fabulous musicians and, or, you know, they were fantastic in school plays. And so there's this whole other intelligence out there that we're, we're not crediting, you know, that we were measuring success in standardized test forms that never ask them to draw a picture, never ask them to play a bar of music, never ask them to write a song or create a story or, or perform on a stage. And that's just wrong. There are all these masters and wonderful artists that have all of this to offer the world. And we should value that. We should value that as educators. We should value that as parents. We should value that as a society. So being able to kind of switch gears, so to speak, and begin to recognize and, uh, and you know, bring to the public's knowledge these unbelievably talented opportunities that existed and to bring this quality of life to our community was not a hard switch to, for me to pull anyway. So this, so this may be uh, a very um, complicated question to answer, but I think you, you have more than anybody will be able to answer this. I'm curious, what is the, what is the business of a symphony like? Like, what is the business model of a symphony and who does what and how does it work? <laughs> well, it, you know, it, it, if it's successful, it should run like a business. It really should. I mean, I, we have kind of a, 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 a two-headed system, so to speak. Uh, we have a board of directors that kind of serves, that does serve as the head of the symphony. And then to those, to that board, there are two of us that kind of report equally. I serve on the business side, and then Maestro Peter Shannon serves on the artistic side. So there's kind of a, a business and an artistic side. And they don't run in opposition of each other. A successful organization, they will run parallel and they will run together, you know, with overlapping at all opportunities. But I orchestrate the, the business side of this, the budget, the ticket sales, the management of the staff, um, you know, patron services, you know, reaching out, scheduling. I report to the board a lot. I kind of manage the board committees and oversee on that side. Whereas then Peter will, you know, he's over concerts and the artistic package. And we have some staff that that does that side. So uh, one side can't exist without the other. And, and so it's real important for us to work as a team. Are the people who that we see on stage playing the violin, are they employees of the symphony or are they independent contractors? Or The Jackson Symphony employs all our artists as independent contractors. So our musicians are all professional musicians. They're not hobby people. They're all professional musicians, most of them with numerous degrees, uh, doctorates, masters, everything in their field. Uh, they have graduated from some of the most prestigious colleges in the U.S., uh, Vanderbilt and, uh, you know, just a number of universities where, and, you know, they have come from. They, most of our musicians sit multiple orchestras, so they will not only play for us, but they'll play for Memphis or Nashville, Paducah, Tupelo, Atlanta. They, our musicians come as far away as Texas and Kansas City and Florida. And, um, and, but most of our musicians come out of Nashville and Memphis. Of course, Nashville it has a large population of professional musicians because so much studio work is done for movies, soundtracks, video games. So they have a lot of work and studio work in that area. Um, and so they're professional musicians. And uh, our symphony is, if you've never heard it, it is outstanding. And we contract in those musicians for so many concerts or, or for the season, kind of depending on what we need for each concert, what the music is for that concert. Do you, and do you perform at the NED? We do not because that stage is not large enough 
you know, and gotcha. uh, it, the venue's not been large enough. But this year, for the very first time, we are taking a concert to the NED. Uh, we are doing, uh, it's a special concert for us, a bit of a fundraiser for us. It's called um, Mozart by Candlelight. And so there will be, we intend to kind of perform uh, a Mozart concert as it was written. Most of Mozart's music was written as chamber music because that was the, you know, it would be written to play in homes and, and at, the, at that time in history. And so we are going to do this with an ensemble of around 14 to 16 musicians, I think. And it'll be done in dim light. And uh, so it, it should be a really unique evening. And the NED works perfectly for that opportunity for us. But most of our yeah. concerts are either at First Baptist Church here in Jackson, which has outstanding kind of perfect acoustics. Most of our master works are done there because we don't have a hall here in in West Tennessee so that we can do that. And that that facility offers us that most perfect kind of opportunity. And then our pop series are done in the Carl Perkins Civic Center because we always just have a larger audience in there and and, and those concerts work well inside there. Um, you reminded me when you said that while ago, the show one recently you and I were talking, I was trying to remember the name of the show it was Mozart, Mozart in the jungle was the show that was on Netflix. That was about the business of a symphony. Right. So that that's the one I was going to tell you. If you haven't seen that yet, you need to watch Mozart. I in the jungle. will add that to my list. <laughs> you can, you can relate to that better than anybody mm-hmm. else in the world. Um, so, um, Tell us a little bit, what is the future of the Jackson Symphony? Obviously, uh, COVID has impacted everything and everybody, but COVID aside, uh, what does the future look like? Well, the Jackson Symphony is certainly on an upward trajectory. We have just been, I mean, we've really been striving in the course of the last two or three years to get the message of the symphony out. And one of the Things that COVID brought us, I mean, you, you know, one of the positives that we found out of this was we decided to take ensembles of the symphony and move them throughout communities. And we have done over 20 of those. We've been able to go into five counties throughout West Tennessee. We've been to Brownsville. We've been to Alamo. We've been to Henderson. Uh, we are headed to Trenton this weekend. Uh, for a concert. We're going to Paris soon. Uh, and not only that, we've been to Humboldt. We're, we're going, uh, we are in neighborhoods throughout. So this has really opened us up in the fact that, you know, it's a little off-putting or our name kind of has been, I think, maybe in the past, you be in the Jackson Symphony, which seems to only be for Jackson or Madison County. Well, that's just not the case. We are West Tennessee Symphony. We're, you know, we're the symphony between Nashville and Memphis. You know, you can come see this symphony and and we're going into our 61st season. We are an old symphony and we have never missed a concert season since 1961. So we are, you know, we're thrilled by that. And, um, we want to make that available to people. And I will have to say is we've watched tickets uh, being sold this year. We did something new this season. We we have this balcony at the, the Civic Center that we've been, you know, that's been undersold. And we wanted to make an opportunity for people to experience the symphony. So we are now selling those four Pops concerts for $100 for the season. You come in, you select your seat. Of course, the balcony seating has this fabulous sound and fabulous view. It's probably the most underrated location in the Civic Center. And uh, we are delighted to see that those tickets have begun to represent areas outside of Madison County. We're noticing that we get, we're selling tickets from all over West Tennessee. And we're thrilled by that opportunity. So I see one of the big things moving forward is the opening up of the symphony to be embraced by all throughout West Tennessee would certainly be the hope. Well, I, as as uh, somebody who's passionate about museums, um, I can also say 
I'm grateful for those of you who are passionate about music and provide that type of inspiration as well. So thank you so much for all you do and and all your staff does. I think it really um, it really makes this whole area even more of a special place to be. It really does, and we're we're delighted to do that and delighted to bring it. And we are you know hopeful that more people will take advantage of the arts that they have available to them. You know. Whether it be museum we'll, or our music, <laughs> we'll put a link to uh, the Jackson Symphony in the show notes. Uh, but if anybody is listening and wants to go uh, find out more, where should they visit? Well, they can go to our website at thejacksonsymphony.org. Uh, also, you're welcome to call the symphony at a seven three one four two seven six four four zero. We're certainly glad to answer any questions and we have a lot of programs attached to our symphony youth programs you know music and healing programs a lot of opportunities for people to engage with the symphony so we certainly would love for people to come and take a look around and see what we are all about fantastic well thank you so much uh for taking some time to talk with us and i just made a note i'm gonna have to go get uh, one of those balcony those balcony seats that sounds like fun Absolutely. We want to see you there. Thanks to all of you who've joined Sherry, Emily, and me today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com.